I'll now introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Professor, just give me a second, Professor Atoshi Iriki, who received his PhD in neuroscience from Tokyo Medical and Dental University <coughs> before moving on to the uh, Rockefeller uh, University. Uh, he subsequently joined the faculty of Toho, Toho University Medical School before returning back to Tokyo as the Chair of uh, Cognitive Neurobiology. Professor Riki currently runs the Laboratory for Symbolic Cognitive Development at the Regan Brain Science Institute and holds positions in Kyoto University, Kyoto University, as well as in the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. He also has a role in Singapore as the uh, co-founding di co director of the Rican NTU Research Centre for Human Biology. In his lab, he tries to uncover the evolutionary precursors of human higher cognitive functions. He's going to talk to us about, and we were debating it a bit earlier, what do you call that word? Presage or presage, uh, whichever up to you, of the Anthropocene. And I'll leave uh, Professor Ricky to elaborate uh, on, on, this, on this topic. Thank you very much for a kind introduction and giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk to you. And the subject I was asked to speak about is evolution of learning that Terry has just introduced as an important factor for human evolution, writing, or learning and, and writings and so on. I'm interested in the mechanism behind it and how the primate brain changes into the human brain. So that is my research subject for past two decades, two, three decades, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And the two, there are two key words that cover the whole of my talk. It's one is Anthropocene, which is a phenomenon. I'm going to talk to you about it through the next couple of slides. And another one is a triadic niche construction. This is the mechanism that I'm proposing behind the Anthropocene. And we usually think that human become smarter, more intelligent, by having a bigger brain than people. And the gradual changes of the bigger brain to be, be more smarter. And there must be some evolutionary mechanism behind it. That is the subject of my whole my talk and my whole my study. And my talk is essentially based on my own work, on, almost only. So when we talk about evolution of a primate, we usually see this kind of evolutionary tree. And the three, there are three kind of species of primates I'm going to mention, the humans and old world monkeys and new world monkeys. But this is, what this describes is not wrong, but it's not fully, full picture of our evolutionary history. What this usual evolutionary tree describes is, is the relationships of the gene sequences of extant taxa, which means the species living right now, assuming from statistical uh, genetic clock when it was bifurcated. So it doesn't mean that humans or humans and New World monkeys have separated three, 35 million years ago. This is true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this represent common ancestor of this place. This has been their own evolutionary tree. So this is something very static, static, of the current view of the extant taxa. So what is lacking in these schemes is spatial temporal dynamics of the actual evolutionary history of the primates. So what is missing in this diagram is already extinct taxa which is extinguished over the past history, and dynamics of the speciation, which how successful the species were, and when was it extinct, or disappeared, or so those kind, and they, where they live, and how they share their niches in, on the globe. So without this whole picture, we cannot think about mechanism behind evolution. In short, and the spatial pattern is primate is evolved somewhere around here when 
the continental drift had just started from the Gondwana continent to Afro-Eurasian continent, uh, primate evolved somewhere here, and separated into the old world, new world, so-called, in the different continent. And in this environment, they have speciated or evolved as a species. So you have to think about the relation between this environment. There have been many climate changes, and many endangered you know, the risks and so on. They have overcame those things. And another thing is the temporal pattern of the evolution of the primates. So these are the extinct taxa. It doesn't exist now. So it doesn't appear in this evolution tree. But we follow this trait and separate it. This is a prosimian, and these are, by the way, the name of the, the geological era or the past history. And these are all extinct. And this lives in Madagascar here. The prosimian, this is primitive primates. And interesting, um, today I'm going to focus about is the New World monkeys, Old World monkeys, and human trait. And what I want to mention in the beginning is that, you know, on the contrary, contrary to our common understandings, what has been first evolved in Old Continent was not Old World monkeys. It was an ancestor of the great apes. The first, there's many uh, Mesocene homos, including homos, and great apes that flourished in the old continent. And it started extinct recently. And they opened the niches. And then afterwards, old world monkeys evolved to occupy those open niches. So there's no series, uh, linear uh, history of new world monkey sequences, new world monkey, old world monkeys, apes, and humans. So this is kind of the other way around. And great apes are almost extinguishing species. There's only four species remaining. Humans, gorilla chimps, orangutans, and bonobos, and whatever, gorillas. And we are endangering species. And there have been like hundreds of homo ancestors there. And they are extinct. Why is it? And this, we have to keep in this kind of dynamics in mind. And there must be some biological mechanism behind it. So this is a phenomenon. And what is Anthropocene is that, in, as a continuation of this geo geological era, what is claimed here recently is the term Anthropocene, which means <coughs> era of humans. So this represents the phenomenon of what is going on now, that human activities are strictly influencing the, geo, uh, the Earth environment. And because of the human activities, Earth is changing. Previously, it was the Earth environment that selected the mutated different species. But now, we are affecting onto the Earth. So we have to consider ourselves as a part of the Earth. And that's why the geologists start calling the present era an Anthropocene the age of the humans on the earth. So this is one key word I have to keep in mind for the rest of the talk. Another one is the triadic niche construction. So that's what it means is that niches, just as like I mentioned before, is defined by as a portion or portion of the resources in, in the environment that species occupy to survive, like a kind of the food or, or the area in the land, or the time in the day, or that kind of you know, definition of the resource of the natural resource of, of, to subserve the species survival. And this is an ecological niche. And then I metaphorically applied this concept onto the neural niche, which means the resources of the brain tissue that subserves activity of those species. If the brain becomes bigger, that means creating the neural niche bigger. And the cognitive niche, and also the metaphorically applying, that kind of the cognitive functions that the brain subserving. So if the brain becomes bigger, we have more cognitive functions. And then cognitive function becomes bigger. And that cognitive function affects on the environment, and there's a triadic, three niches interact with each other. In 
their own ways of the respective species. And what triadic misconstruction means, what I, how I define is that during the long time of the course of the evolution, by interaction of three kinds of niches, it's gradually expanded or improved in a sense to become gradually to become the human triadic niche construction. Bigger brains absorb more cognitive capacity, have more improvement of the environment, and we adapt to this improved environment. Like Terry just said, we are surrounded by tools and buildings and so on. So there must be some biological mechanism behind it. Then the question is, how can we prove scientifically this mechanism behind this triadic niche construction? As you know, this uh, to be, be a science, there's come some principle. It has to be reproducible, it has to be universal, and it, you have to be able to predict something. But evolution, you can never do this, you know. Evolution is never reproducible, it's not universal. Once it's happened, it's happened, and that's all. And it's almost impossible to predict. So evolution, the study of evolution, might not be a science. So that's probably why there's many you know, crazy, fluffy, fluffy ideas about stories about evolution, but there must be some mechanism behind it that can be explained by science. And that's what I'm challenging and tackling. And I'm going to talk about, introduce about how am I doing this very risky challenges. So my talk will be comprised of three parts. The firstly, since evolution is the changes of the genetic patterns or sequences or whatever, that includes some changes of the mechanism or structure or whatever. So the change must be induced by learning, which is the subject of this talk, and all, or education, if you say that active education or active pedagogy that you, you mentioned, you need some active processes of plasticity, in, inducing plasticity in the brain. Even though it's not in the long term, brain has to have a capacity to adapt to those learning-induced plasticity. So we can extract it in the lab as an element or principle behind evolutionary mechanisms. This is my first part. And second part will be by combining the small bits of many data acquired from the lab, I, can, we can, I have to construct a hypothesis how it interacts to become the base principle of the evolutionary mechanisms. And the result of this is triadic niche construction. I'm going to tell you later about this. But this is kind of, we have to speculate. We have to make a think deeply to come up with a, a testable hypothesis. This is the second part. And final part is how to prove it. You cannot reproduce evolution in the lab. And that's almost impossible to prove it. And I thought how to prove it is to look into the nature and the field and trying to find evidence that can prove this hypothesis. So the third part will be, this is still on the way, I cannot tell you about the conclusion, but this is probably the scientific way to tackle this important problem. So this is also the interaction of the lab data and the theory and the study in the field or reality to prove in the reality. So I think this is the scientific way I came up with to tackle this evolutionary mechanisms based on the learning of the brain. So let's start with the first subject, which is a learning or education induced neural or cognitive plasticity. And we want to, I want to find the evidence in the primate brain there must be some element that can represent or comprise the basis of the, hum uh, the human evolution. So what I did is not looking naively into the primate as it is, but rather I tried to manipulate the primate brain to extract what kind of changes that manipulation can induce 
although it's unnaturalistic, or it's not happening in the wild or nature, but we can, if we can manipulate it, we can prove the latent capacity of the primate brain that holds these mechanisms. So what I did in the beginning is I trained a Japanese macaque to use tools and also the video tricks. So this is about 25 years ago or so. The Japanese macaques, they almost never use tools in, in the wild. But you could, be train, you could train, train them to use, this is a kind of a rake, to collect the distant food. And he's not directly seeing this scenery, but what he's doing is, this is the second step of training, is looking at the video monitor, through uh, the image captured through this camera. It's like a video game. And Japanese macaque never use TV in the forest. So this is very artificial, but could be trained rather easily. Probably there, there are some basic mechanism behind it that allow them to do this very, rather easily. And if you introduce a spot here, he thinks that it's there, and he tried to take it. So meaning that he's very much adaptive to this artificial environment, like us, the kids playing the video game. So we are love the video game because we have the mechanism to subserve it. Although it was not designed at the beginning, from the beginning, to use it, but it's adapted to something else in the, in the primary brain. But we just apply to this principle into some additional intelligent behavior. And this is behavior. And the neural mechanism behind it, I'm not going to, into the detail over this talk, but briefly what I did is recorded a neuron, neural activity from, from the parietal cortex. This is a human brain from, the, from the looking at the left side. And I come back to this point later, but these colored areas are called primary sensory areas, which is the entrance of information from the peripheral sensory organ into the cortex. And the white areas are called association areas that associate the basic information that collected by the peripheral organ and integrate in the brain. So these are the areas of the integ information integration. And I poke stick the electrode into parietal cortex surrounded by visual and tactile and auditory area and recorded the neuron that respond to the hand, both to the tactile response, uh, tactile stimulation, which means palpation or touch sensation of the hand, and also the visual information related to the hand. This is a trajectory of the probe scanning around the monkey hand in space. And this dot represents the location of the probe when this neuron gave to firing neuron discharges. So this neuron fires like brr, 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 something like this. And this can, you can define the visual receptive field of this neuron. So the receptive field means that location of the surrounding world that stimulation give rise to activity in the neural structure. So this is the visual receptive field, which means visual responses related to the hand, and at the same time, tactile receptive field, which means the somewhat sensory or tactile sensation related to the hand. And this neuron responds equally to both, meaning that it integrates the information related to the hand, and thereby interpretation I'm hanging around is that these neurons are coding the image of the hand introspectively. You have some image of the hand, if you close your eye, you have an image that the hand is somewhere else and you can feel it. So this is what parietal cortex neuron is doing. And interesting thing was that when the, in the situation where that monkeys were using tools, these receptive fields extended along the tool, meaning that this neuron did not differentiate hand and tool. The tool is incorporating your hand, or your hand image extended on the tool. So the tool became part of your body. So this, your body image was modified. And this receptive field are formed in the video monitor, meaning that actually neural activity-wise, imaging the video monitor became a part of your hand. I think you have this kind of sensation, you are very much concentrated in the video game. But don't do that too much. That will manipulate your brain, we can tell you later. But anyway, so this is 
the phenomena. And I'm skipping this part, but it actually represent some basic function that's responsible for the evolution of the stone tools over the history of the archaeological record of the human archaeology. But I just uh, mentioned just like that. And after monkeys have acquired basic usage of the tool, single tool, then if you expose the monkeys to in this situation, monkey almost immediately adapt to the environment and they can combine the tool in a sequential way or meaningful structure of the actions. So there are some basic structure built bits and bits to become more complex and higher integrated intelligence. And brain activity responsible for this structure, uh, this behavior, was in addition to the parietal neural activity, there was some prefrontal activity detected by PET imaging technique. So this is this. And I told you that we can train, monkey never do this in the wild, but we can train this, train the monkey to use this in rather short period of time. It's usually like 10 days or two weeks. This is not very long, but it's not very short. There must be some biological mechanism behind it to make monkeys able to adapt to this behavior. And first we found was a very basic gene expression in this particular area of the brain. And accompanying this gene expression, we found modification in the neural circuitry. I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not going into detail, but the neural circuitry actually reorganized to make the new mode of sensor uh, information integration in association cortex. So you can induce this kind of learning or training induced plasticity artificially and manipulate or control it experimentally and induce some modification in the brain. So the primate brain is furnished with this kind of plasticity from some other purposes. I, I'm not, I don't have a time to get into detail because we can talk about it in discussion, but primate brain is plastic to make additional neural circuitry and additional some, some things. So this means that primate brain is not stable. This has like a spectrum-like capacity, range of the capacities that can be manipulated by artificial training or learning processes. So left-hand side is very much simplified level of human intelligence from the skillful movement to philosophy. Well, there are many dimensions of the intelligence, but I just, for graphical reason, I made it in, uh, in the simple, single dimension. But here, it is, shows the spectrum of the human intelligence. Of the normal humans are born at this level, and through the natural development and education, some of us can become philosopher. Not everybody, but we have a capacity to become philosopher. So this kind of spectrum of the range of the human intelligence can be manipulated, altered by educational or pedagogy processes. Uh, on the contrary, in monkeys, N and W stands for normal and wild monkeys, are, develop, are born at this level and they develop to this level and stop there because it's not necessary for them or even it's unbeneficial for them to go farther beyond. If the monkeys start playing with the video game in the forest, they will be killed by others, animals, predators. So it's better not do that in their environment. So, they, so that's why they don't do that, but it could be artificially trained to expand this capacity to some extent. I don't think they can become Aristotle or something like this, but well, there must be some spectra that can be expanded by experimental manipulation. And what is good about this is that by expanding, you know, upgrading the monkey brain, we can create overlap between human intelligence, a higher quantity function, and study biological mechanisms of human, like language, I don't know, but philosophy, I don't know, but biological mechanisms of this as a monkey, as using a monkey as a model of uh, elements of those functions. And also, we can find structure of the human intelligence 
The example is what I did is 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 that I talked about a tool which is a motor apparatus, the regular extension of the motor organs. But if you think about the kind of the tools that humans are using, we can use externalized sensory organs. But it's rarely studied in, in non-human animals. So I first attempted to train the monkey with kind of an endoscope. You know, endoscope, the gastro camera, the physicians look into your stomach. So that's a camera, it's like an eye, a sensory organ, attached to the stick and poke into the place that you can not see usually, but you can see it. But I thought this is also easy, but it didn't work at all for a few years, because probably there was, the training method was wrong. And the trick that I came up with is attach the sensory cue on the tip of the already acquired motor skill. So this is not externalized eye, but this is it's kind of, the monkey, this rig has a mirror on the, on the other side. And what this monkey is doing, or trained to do, and acquired in few days is that, you know, monkey cannot see beyond this hump, and he can explore it. It's rather easily, and take it. So monkey has some basically acquired skill to manipulate the body image and attach the sensory cue there. And this was one of the easy step that monkey can learn rather rapidly. If you look from the back, it looks like this. Monkey is actively searching by using the mirror as an externalized kind of supplement of the sensory organs. And then take it. And there are a few steps that we could take, but finally, monkey could use an endoscope. Uh, this is a small camera attached to the rake, and he is exploring under the table, a big table, and looking at the monitor, projecting the image captured by this external sign. So this is kind of externalized sensory organ manipulate by your hand. So there are kind of the structure of the human uh, the intelligence. And question is, what happens if you look back yourself by your own externalized eye? And this is difficult to train uh, doing the monkey. So what I did is to put a subject in a scanner and show them this kind of video. This is just a simple video, three persons throwing the ball each other from the different perspective. The subjects are passively viewing this. And what I ask the subject to do is to press a button in two conditions. In one condition, subject asks to press a button when at the top of the trajectory of the red person throwing the ball to the blue person. And this gives you the sense that you are passive, or you are passively viewing the three other persons throwing the ball each other. The another point uh, uh, situation is that Subject asks to press a button when black person received the ball and press the button and he throw back to the other person. So you have a strong sense of becoming a black person yourself. And the subjects are doing this in a different task and different condition of the viewing angles. In one angle, each time the perspective changes. And in other, other situation, the perspective stays for a while. And in this way, you can design a two by two factorial design, you call it, and calculate the brain activity responsible for viewing yourself by your own externalized eye from floating around in the space. It's kind of out of body experience or acquiring the third person's view of yourself. And we found this temporal parietal junction is responsible for this kind of the function in the humans. And this is a very close, have a very close link with the location we found the neural activity for using tools. So, this is the brain activity you look yourself by your own eye or meta self recognition. And what you would have acquired a sense is that continuation objectively, objectively of yourself over time, from pre past, present to the future. If you don't have this kind of the mental settings, 
you are living in the immediate time and space. It's like uh, non-human animals, it's immediate creatures. But if you have a sense of your meta self recognition, you acquire a sense that your core self exists and continue from the past, present, and future. And what you start thinking might be that if you have useful information now, you want to try to keep it and use it later, like a writing mechanism that Terry had spotted out. So this is a kind of externalized memory device or externalized brain. And in a sense, we can plan for the future and we can plan improving the future. So this comes in the evolutionary mechanisms. We have been taught originally evolution was induced by environmental changes and natural selection and genetic mutation. What is adapted to the environment will select it by nature. So this is the natural selection theory that Darwin has proposed 150 years ago. But there's another theory, it's called niche construction, that activity of the animals modify the environment and create a new niche and occupy that. A typical example is a beaver. Beaver is an animal living in the mountain, but they create a dam and they create a pond or aqueous environment, and that's a new niche, and they occupy that niche and survive in that environment. This is called niche construction. But what's different from humans and beavers are that humans constantly thinking about improving the future. And beaver never improves the dam or, you know. So that's different. So this is kind of the positive feedback between environment and they create the new tools and constantly embedding in the environment for the next generations. So I call it intentional niche construction. And this is the first niche construction mechanism that I'm going to talk about today. And because of this, we are start improving or modifying the environment. So this is the kind of the precursor of the Anthropocene. The human started affecting the environment massively to modify it. It's not passively accepting or adapting to the environment, but it's kind of vice versa. So this is kind of phenomenon. And what is the neural mechanism or concrete neural mechanism behind it is the next question. So next we need a hypothesis to prove it. And hypothesis has to be based on experimental evidence. And this is the procedure of the natural uh, sciences. And what I did in, at the beginning, a few years ago, is just apply the voxel-based morphology. This is a kind of a, a digital structure uh, analysis method. Apply this to the monkeys learning to use tools. And we found extension of the gray matter of the parietal cortex where we found recorded new, uh, bimodal neuron from, in addition among other, a few other areas. So, it's not just a modification of gene expression and neural, market neural circuitry, but it's actually the brain portion expands, in this case by 20% in two weeks. There's a huge expansion. And I thought this is a precursor of the neural niche construction. And like the muscles, if you use it very often, and if it's very useful, that expands, put more resources to stabilize the mechanisms. I think this is a basic principle of the biological organisms. If something is demanding or something useful, you put more resources to stabilize it. And if you have more resources, you can apply that same principle to another, like a side effect, another function like a side effect. And in this way, we have, can have acquired the room to expand our neural structure and thereby the cognitive function. And this area in the monkey brain and human brain. If you compare this, this was the location where expanded most during the course of evolution. And if you compare the, uh, the areas, the brain areas of the humans and monkey brain, you know, monkey, uh, human brains are much bigger than monkeys. And this is a classical Broadman's aerial map. You can see that humans have more different areas than macaque monkeys. So bigger brain have more areas. This is kind of the principle of the primate brain design. And 
parietal cortex is a location sitting here. And since the monkey parietal cortex is mostly folded in the sulcus, so if you open the sulcus and compare the structure of the human and monkey parietal cortex, it looks like this. This is a monkey brain and human brain, and parietal cortex is surrounded by primary sensory areas that I, I told you in the beginning. Visual cortex, auditory cortex, and somatosensory cortex, same as humans. And what are parietal cortex doing in monkey brain, no human primate brain, is essentially they are analyzing the space and creating the movement in the space. You know, the monkey, monkey's movement became three-dimensional. They live in the forest and jumping around the forest, branches. The other animals, including us, are two-dimensional, walking on the ground. So monkey, the primate, are demanded or required to process the 3D information and coordinate transformation to make effective movement. So this is what all parietal cortex is all about. And that's why the primate parietal cortex expanded. And to control the primate cortex, the pre prefrontal cortex expanded to use it. I, I'm not touching on it today, but parietal cortex, if you plot the, where can we move? There's, there's not many places that we can move. We can either move eyes or hands or head or locomotion of the whole body. And if you uh, plot the parietal area responsible for this movement creation, monkey parietal cortex is almost occupied by these areas. And you can, at the same time, plot this area into the human brain too. We need those uh, information processing, so there are these areas in the human too. But there's many areas in between that doesn't exist in monkeys, but sitting around there. And this is area that's expanded most, and this is more uh, larger scale neural niche construction. And what is human parietal cortex doing is the next question beside the spatial information processing. So then what I did is the meta-analysis of, this is a few years ago, about 100 papers related to the non-spatial processing of the parietal cortex. And again, I cannot get into detail, but many of the papers or functions attributed to parietal cortex are dealing with time or number or symbols or logic but all in the form of spatial information processing. If you think about the way we think in any languages or any culture, the logical structure, structure itself, is a metaphor of the process of the space, the secret behind it, something under the table, where you build up the logic on top of the basic fundamentals. But these are all spatial information principles. So the reason is that the parietal cortex is a cortex that processes spatial information. And if it's useful, put more resources. And using this principle can be applied to other cognitive functions. And including language and mathematics are also attributed here. You can find it somewhere there. So these are the human higher cognitive function using existing resources but creating the new cognitive capacity, including language, mathematics, calculations, AIs, and so on. So I called it cognitive niche construction, creating a new cognitive niches. And here, if you compare the different brains of the different species, the fundamental design is all the species have primary cortices because they have eyes and nose and you know, so, so on. This is the fundamental of design of the mammals. And beside the, uh, the primary cortices, there are many white areas in between, which are the association areas. And as I have been talking that, if you compare the primate brain from a small brain of the marmoset, it's like, like a mouse brain, and the human brain, and bigger brain have more white areas more brain areas. So this looks like a common principle, but this is not. And the primate brain essentially, when they expand, have more neurons and more brain areas, thereby more inter-area connections. But if you compare the rodents, as a mice, you know, the mice brain, 
And probably some of you know the capy what capybara is. Capybara is the huge rodent. It's like 100 kilograms living in South America. And if you compare capybara with, uh, this is I think a squirrel monkey, you can know how huge the capybara is. And the capybara brain is like a macaque brain, like the size of this your fist. And the design of the capybara brain is almost analogous to mice occupied by primary cortices, and there's rarely associated areas. So the principle, designing principle of the human uh, primate brain and non-primate brain is fundamentally different. In the primate brain, this is built in or as a principle design as it expands. There's more neurons, more areas, and more inter-area connections. It's constantly built up, creating the new neural niches. This is the principle of the primate brain. So this, we are constrained by these governing principles, and this is very considered to be very unique to the primates. And thereby, from the natural selection to intentional niche construction, we reach to the triadic niche construction. And what is good about this is that we can ground the mechanism of the culture onto the biological mechanisms you know, the culture, the art, and philosophy that have been the subject of humanity sciences. But in now, in this way, we can ground onto the brain natural science subject or object to study objectively. But you might think that what, what I have been talking so far is a plasticity in the lifetime. It cannot be the evolutionary mechanisms. You have to be carried on to the next generation through the genomic sequences. That's how we naturally think. But so for this anthropocene to happen, we have to come up with some mechanisms that this learned, learning acquired capacity has to be transmitted to the next generations. And the previously known genomic mutation and natural selection doesn't explain this. So what we have been start knowing is that, like Terry told me about the methylation and so on, epigenetic mechanisms, extra genomic factors that transmitted to the next generation by acquisition of one generation to the next. And another thing is, I want to claim is the environment. If you modify the environment, build a building, this is kind of information. If you grow the next offsprings of the next generations, that have to adapt to this new modified information in their early development of life. So this kind of information, kind of another kind of the epigenetic information embedded in the environment and transmitted to the next generation. So there must be some mechanism like this to explain this rapid primate evolution of the recent years. And the question is how to prove it. We cannot prove it in the, in the land, so we have to go to the field. And before getting into, into that, I want to revisit the evolution of the evolutionary history. So we think as a premise, the Darwinian natural selection as a principle of evolution, but it was proposed only 150 years ago in Origin of Species. And actually this was a copy of the Ramalk, or the philosophy of the zoology. It's written about 50 years before this, but well, I'm not getting into this. But Darwinian natural selection comprised of three concepts, variation, inheritance, and natural selection. And this Darwin theory has almost extinct after 70 years by discovery of DNA, because there's no variation. DNA is a kind of point-to-point -point mutation, digital mutation. And there's no continuum variation. And in this way, it's almost terminated, but it was the genius of the Julian Huxley who proposed modern synthesis and unified Darwinian theory with DNA and gene sequences. And this is based on this kind of concept. This is called neo-Darwinism, happened 70 years ago, and probably all the generation, including us, have been educated in this way. So that's why we think, believe that genetic information has to be carried on by genetic sequences, and it, unless it was modified, the genetic sequences of the germline, it cannot be the evolution mechanism, but which is not. Now we are start knowing that epigenetic mechanisms, evolutionary theory, niche construction theory, there are many other alternatives 
that can support these evolutionary changes. And this will work very well for the primate evolution. I talked about the triadic niche construction. And in the, the hypothesis is, this is a very abstract figure, but there's no other way to explain this. This white blank bar represents environmental variation. And this box represents gene sequences of one species. And this means that expression pattern of the one gene sequence is matched to the environmental pattern survives. And natural selection says if the environmental condition changes, the gene sequences that matches that changes were selected. This is natural selection. But if you look into taking into account other mechanisms, it can be that if the environment was modified in certain range, there must be a limit. But you can, the species can adapt to that environment by learning capacity or built-in plasticity of the existing capacity. But this has to be learned every time, each time and each time. But the question is here. If it's, it was continued, succeeded or transmitted over the generation stably or modified environment, then it has to be, there must be some automatic mechanism, probably epigenetic first, to express in this pattern from the beginning. And after epigenetic changes or kind of the changes was induced, always it becomes automatic without individual learnings. And since the genetic mutation is neutral, assuming it's neutral, it's maybe not, but assuming it's neutral, then direction of the mutation toward this direction will be biased and selected. And then gene sequences changes or the gene sequence and mutation comes later. So this is kind of, superficially, this is very notorious ramalchism, but it's not. There must be some mechanism subserving this. It's called, actually called Baldwin effect or genetic assimilation. That could explain this. And this information could be carried on by, I'm not getting, going to detail the mirror neuron system, but some you know, uh, the learning based neural mechanisms and modification by an epigenetic mechanism. That can be the mechanism of serving. So this is just a hypothesis. And then, how can we prove it in nature? I explained about this slide, and tool use may be the, one of the keys that expand this spectrum. And after this spectrum is expanded, there's many interesting behavior that monkeys start exhibiting. However, it has to be trained. But what is different, and what has to be proved in, as an evolution mechanism is that this should happen automatically. And where is it? And I didn't explain about this bar. And W stands for wild. And if you compare, as a biological organ, the primate brain, or a, a, a human brain as a primate brain, you have to compare. It's not fair to compare the train, a, a naive animal with educated humans. You have to compare with wild humans as a biological organs. But from the definition, there doesn't exist, does not exist such as wild humans. We are not wild. That's why we are humans. That's why our typical explanation. And what happens probably is that social pressure that's modified a small bits of things in the human brain and manipulate it and start teaching each other the pedagogy, learning each other. And in this way, although it can be slower than the learning in the one generation, one lifetime, but it can reproduce the identical mechanism that can be induced by artificial human training. And I looked into the nature to find out can there be some species exhibiting this. And in this way, probably human mind and intelligence, including language and so on, might have emerged automatically. And what I did is that trying to find out the same species doing the different thing depending on the environment and also the different species doing the same thing 
in a different environment. This is a kind of two by two factorial design and trying to prove it in the nature. And what I first start doing first is, is one of the colleagues, I'm not sure if he's here, is one of NTU colleagues studying in the nat natural macaque in the Indian Ocean. And there are, as I told you before, macaques never use tools in the wild or in the mainland. But there are a group of macaques in the Indian Ocean, isolated island, that use tools naturally. And this is one picture, video taken over there. That's, these are the macaques, the family or groups. And they are cracking the oysters, using a stone to crack the tools. And everybody's doing this as a family in pedagogy. And in early development processes, they must be learning each other, teaching each other. And the same species in the mainland never do this. And because they are eating oysters, you see the tidal difference here. This is a high tide and low tide, it's about four meters here. It's washed out every day and supplied with a fresh oyster. And oyster is high nutrition. They have the very efficient foraging time. They have more time to think. And there's no predator here. And there's massive uh, oysters here. And also the stone that can be used too here. The condition is accidentally matched, allow them to use tools. And since this is more, mostly efficient, the population density is very packed about 10 times more than the usual macaques. So there's a social interaction there, and teaching each other, and accidental combination with this condition, they start using tools. So my uh, plan now is to compare the same species in the mainland and in this island, and see what's the difference of their brain is. And if you immigrate each other, they must, you can study the cultural transmission, across cultural interactions, the brain mechanism subserving it, so this is one possibility. And another thing is different species doing similar things. I come, coming to the marmoset. Marmoset is a new world monkey living in Brazil, around here. And although they were believed formally to be very primitive, but they are not. Actually, they have rich vocal communication, social structure, altruism, you know, very human-like social structures. And that Terry have mentioned about FOXP2, but we have sequenced the marmoset gene and compared the so-called language genes and compared across species of the humans, apes, and old world monkeys and new world monkeys. And surprisingly, the new world monkeys are closest to the human in terms of languages. So why is it? It's not so primitive animals. The reason is this spatial temporal dynamics. I already explained about this tree, and private emerged evolved here, and then immigrated into the new world and old world. In the old world, as I told you before, the human have flourished in the beginning, the human ancestors, and accumulated a human species trait, including languages. But in the new world, there didn't exist humans. So in the old world, it is beneficial for other non-human non species. That's uh, radiated after the open niche was created, it, it's better to avoid the human specific trait. It's beneficial for them to segregate the niches. But in the new world, because human didn't exist, if the older human specific trait was accumulated in one species, they become human, but it didn't happen. So humans have on, only invaded very recently. But before that, they have evolved or segregated the niches in a different patterns. So probably, this is just a guess. The language-related trait was accumulated in the marmoset, and the tool-using trait was accumulated in, in the capuchin monkey. In this way, probably, they have different segregation pattern, the sharing the niches and segregating the niches, and thereby, marmoset have closest sequence with the human language genes. And this is how the human intelligence evolved and in this way, humans start to modify the environment, and this is probably the basis of Anthropocene, and human is not a special species, and human does not own the Earth. This is just a part of the Earth, evolved, co-evolved with environmental conditions and humans. And this is the concept of the Chinese philosophy, is Xin Den, A-E. This means that everything and humans are part of the same thing. 
And probably you have to think in this way. In addition to the lab experiment by reduction and reproduction. So I have talked about triadic niche construction and anthropocene and learning and expansion is the basic principle that we have been doing. And here is the last question. All these trade claims that our way of thinking, our life is dependent on the growth. Old economics capacity, social capacity, everything is based on the growth. Otherwise we extinct, we think that. So, but we cannot escape from this because this triadic niche construction is learning and expansion of the things. So this is a built-in principle as a primate that human cannot escape from. And then the question is that we have been keep growing and the, everything but design by assumption of the growth, but is there a limit? It's a limit of the growth. It's an idea hanging around for a few years, of these years recently. And we can avoid it. However, the response to this question, if I was to answer, is that yes, we cannot avoid it. We cannot escape from it. But only when we extrapolate or extend the existing mindset to exploit the resources of the earth, then there's a limit. But what we have, I have been talking is not expansion of the existing framework, but it was triadic niche construction. So by extending to extending primate, the human instinct or human principle, based on the primate design, brain design, that we can construct a new dimension of the resources. That's all niche construction is about. And I would be rather a bit optimistic about the limitation to growth. I don't know how to go in. I cannot predict it because evolution can, is not, never predictable. But there's a constraint of the human brain. So there is a hope that somebody can do this. And I will end my talk by thanking to my colleagues. Thank you very much.